Welcome to the first episode of Talking College Baseball. I am your co-host, Chris Barber, and I am the youngest brother on this podcast and the youngest brother of three. I am your other co-host, Joe Sparber, and I am the oldest brother on this podcast. And today we're just going to start off by giving you a little background info and our motives on why we decided to start this podcast. Yeah, I mean, our motivation for launching this podcast is to share our, our own college baseball journey, as well as the stories of m- numerous guests who will be joining us on this show. The lineup of guests includes well-known figures in the college baseball community that some of you might know, giving you the opportunity to not only listen to our experiences, but also to hear theirs. From present players, coaches, and parents to numerous professional baseball players, the podcast offers a diverse range of perspectives. So we hope you enjoy, and um, let's get to it. Not only is it going to be big figures that you know from college baseball, but also guys who either were coaches or continue that their their career and are now professional athletes and in the major leagues. So before we get any uh, guests on, we're going to give us give you guys our background, and we're going to start off with uh, Chris today. So, Chris, what decide what made you decide to play baseball? Why why baseball? Yeah, so um, for me, it really started at you know it started in like eighth grade, and I uh, I really didn't like baseball. It's up until my freshman year of high school. It was very uh, unique. I was more of a basketball and football type of player, and I wasn't into baseball as much. All right, so Chris, a uh, little background. He was a gifted athlete, was a three-sport athlete, and come high school time, he had the opportunity to choose whether he wanted to play high school, baseball, high school football, high school basketball, and he ended up choosing to do all three of them. Uh, As time went on, you became a junior and a senior. Chris decided college baseball was his route. That's what he wanted to do in the future, and he ended up giving up uh, basketball and football. Why? Why did you give him up? Um, Yeah, so basically with basketball, um, start off with that. Uh, It was my favorite sport. Like I said, in eighth grade and I got to high school and it just wasn't as it just wasn't as fun for me. I didn't really have as much drive for uh, for basketball as I did with uh, with baseball and um, with football. Um, it was the same thing. I mean, I thought I was going to really like it. I thought I was going to want to pursue base or uh, football. Um, but then I just fell in love with uh, with baseball and what baseball had to offer and what it, you know what it taught me and, and all that kind of, all that kind of stuff. It really, uh, it really intrigued me more to want to take my game to the next level. And, you know, I think, I think you being, you know, being a huge part of, of, of that, uh, helped me decide that I wanted to pursue baseball, watching you in high school and, and, uh, your journey with travel ball and, and, and just with the training you used to do and the training used to take me, I think I fell in love with it you know, kind of following in your footsteps, which it, it really helped me to um, to want to advance my game and want to kind of do that in, co- in college. That's pretty cool. I never knew that. I never knew that me playing baseball and liking baseball kind of made you continue in my footsteps and also like the game. It's really good to hear. Um, now, knowing that you're going to go play college baseball, uh, you knew you wanted to play, so you had the options of D1, D2, D3, or JUCO. And you, with your talent, thinking Division One was it. You were going to go play Division One baseball like me. Uh, what happened? Yeah, so throughout high school, obviously, I saw your recruitment process, and it was challenging. Of course, it's challenging for thousands of kids out there. And um, I thought that it would have been – you know, it would be the same type of thing for me, you know, go, going D1. Um, I saw a whole bunch of people I knew commit to a D, D1 school early. And, um, you know, I thought to myself, that's what I want to do. I want to play Division I. Um, I really had nothing else in mind except doing that. Obviously, I wanted to play Division I at the highest level as well. Like I wanted to play in, 
the ACC or the SEC. That was kind of my goal and what I wanted to do. Um, but it was way harder than I thought. The recruitment process is crazy and it's very challenging. It's not like, it's not like what you think. And, um, it, it, things just were very difficult. So initially you did have a, a few division one offers, uh, right before COVID-19, the pandemic. And you were supposed to, you committed to the University of Miami and you were going to come play with me during my senior year, your freshman year. Uh, can you tell us what happened around COVID? What, what made that stop, change? Yeah, so um, basically I was going to the University of Miami as a, um, as a preferred walk-on, which I was more than happy with because, um, you know, that was my only Division One opportunity. I didn't really have many D2s, uh, two, a couple of D3s, but University of Miami obviously was always my dream, like it was yours, and it was the greatest time of <laughs> of my baseball career. I thought at that point I was in a, I was, I made it. I got to University of Miami, my goal, and um, boom, COVID-19 hits, and it affected millions of people, obviously. And it affected me big time because with COVID-19, as you know, roster spots get cut. The roster spots really slim down and schools are only allowed to have a certain amount. And um, when that happened, it was kind of like, "Uh uh-oh, what do I do now type of thing. And, you know, talking with the coaches there and, you know, they helped me through the process and they're really good about it. But at the end of the day, with COVID-19 and the roster spots, there's nothing you can do with that. So at that point, I'm sitting there. I'm planning on going to University of Miami. School gets canceled or senior year gets canceled, and I have no place to go. So what Chris was talking about with roster spots, for people who aren't aware of this, um, when COVID-19 hit – the draft ended up getting postponed. So the MLB draft usually has, it used to have 40 rounds. Having 40 rounds, I think, what is it, Chris? 1,200 players get drafted? With 40 rounds? Uh, yeah, about 1,200 people get yeah, drafted. Better, and, then that means, and then if that happens, you lose a lot of, you gain a lot of roster spots for the upcoming year because the juniors and seniors in college are able to get drafted. So the team becomes smaller. If you have a team of 35 guys and five guys get drafted or eight guys get drafted, well, then you have 27 teams or kids who graduate, et cetera. Now, when COVID hit, not only did it affect the draft, the rounds changed to five rounds. So there were only going to be 150 kids being drafted. Um, a couple of my roommates, we're going to have them on the podcast, were greatly affected by this. They would have been first round there in big time draft picks who ended up staying up back in college because the draft really affected them it also affected um roster spots as a whole because the high school kids coming up were now affected as guys like chris so with this change we either had to make cuts because seniors and juniors all gained the year of eligibility or you just had to tell the kids who were originally coming to the school that you recruited we don't have room for you and that's what ended up happening to Chris. So where did you go from here? Yeah, so, you know, obviously with with COVID-19 happening, everyone got a year back. So it wasn't just, it was not just University of Miami. This was nationwide, every level, every division. And everyone got a year back. So everyone's everyone's delayed a year, including high school guys. So most high, a lot, I know a lot of high school guys who, did a fifth year of high school, which schools started opening up fifth year options. Like you go fifth year high school player, which gives you another year of recruitment and it doesn't let you get into the mess of college baseball at the time. However, for me, I didn't go that route. Our parents Some weren't of you gonna knowing let that me. Happen. So you guys know our parents <laughs> are not gonna let Chris stay back a year in high school. They said you have to move out. That is correct. They were saying, you know, this is not ha- – you can't go back to high school. Like, you you just graduated high school. You're not going back. 
we are going to take a little break. So yeah, getting introduced to the junior college world, it was it was different. I mean, we knew what junior college was, but um, we lived across the street from uh, Brookdale Community College, um, which is, you know, a small community college in New Jersey. So we knew what it was, but we thought that's what it was. That's the only thing that they had. They, I mean, we had we didn't know anything about regions, divisions in in junior college. We thought junior college was just community colleges across the country, and they play locally. No. Yeah. Our, our junior brother, college is a whole different went world. There for school, and That's one right. of my best friends actually went there with him. So both of them were students at this community college, and they're always saying, oh, we're JUCO, we're JUCO. And a lot of guys on my team in Miami, like a couple of pitchers and a couple of my friends, good friends now, were always saying, we're JUCO bandits, we're JUCO bandits. And none of us, we, neither of us knew what that meant. And so Chris started looking deeper and deeper into it. Yeah, I mean, it was, uh, I got a call. I remember getting a call from a uh, small school in North Carolina named Lewisburg College. Lewisburg College, I mean, I have never even heard of Lewisburg, North Carolina. People in North Carolina. Don't even know what Lewisburg is. People that are an hour away in Raleigh don't know where Lewisburg is. So me from New Jersey, thinking I'm going to the University of Miami, ending up getting a call from a small school, mind you, has 250 enrolled students on the campus. Compared to big powerhouse University of Miami. I was like, what is this? What's junior college? On the phone with the assistant coach, recruiting coordinator, Billy Funk, he calls me and he sells me Lewisburg <laughs> like I'm going to Vander, Vandy. I mean, he was telling me that Lewisburg is this, Lewisburg is that. It's got great cafeteria. It's got the, ca the batting cages. So when I heard about Lewisburg Junior College, he was telling me about Division One, Division Two, II, Division Three. They're a Division One, the only Division One in North Carolina. So me and my dad, we decided. Why not drive to North Carolina? Just take a look. He's saying how great it is, and so we did. So junior college, you end up driving down, and you decide that's where you're going to go. That's where you're going to spend the next year or next two years. Because the draft really wasn't uh, a thing in your mind at the time. You didn't think you were going to even be thought about to get drafted your senior year of high school. So you get to Lewisburg freshman year. And uh, explain to what it was like. Was it actually everything the coach told you? Was it completely different? So I get to Lewisburg, and the coach was 100% right with everything to have there. However, when you get there, it doesn't tell you about – I didn't know how many kids were there. I didn't know what the campus life was. I didn't know what the – the dorm was like. So I get to Lewisburg College, my first my first day at Lewisburg College. I move in with my parents. On uh, my room number, 318. 318. I'm like, okay, 318. Third floor, three flights of stairs, no elevator. We're like, okay, you know, no elevator. <laughs> it's freshman in college. It's fine. So we're lugging, lug, um, the refrigerator up, the microwave, all that kind of stuff. We get in there. I mean, when I tell you it is, it was like a jail cell size, okay? Very small, but due to COVID, I had my room to myself. So so did everyone else. The whole building, right hall, this is what it was called, was just baseball players. That's it, which was pretty cool. I, I used to call it Lewisburg Hotel. <laughs> Because it's just baseball players and there's just single rooms and whatever. I thought it was awesome. I thought it was so cool living by myself in the dorms. Um, first night rolls around. I'm laying in bed and, you know, obviously there's no air conditioning. <laughs> so there's no air conditioning. It's it's August. It's really hot. No AC. I have a fan blowing. 
Um, the bathrooms, community bathrooms. Uh, usually one shower has hot water. That's what it was my freshman year. One shower had hot water on our floor, um, which I thought was really unique. And um, But no, I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed living in that hall. So, I mean, you made the best out of a bad situation, considering. But coming committed to Miami, going to be like where I am. Looked like paradise. The field is paradise. The dorms are okay in Miami, but nothing compared to what Chris is talking about. Ours blew his out of the water. Um, tell us a little bit how the season went. Tell us how uh, your fall went, your spring, the coaches, the players. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, fall in the fall, we were um, – I mean, we did normal baseball training in the fall. Um, our head coach, Blake Herring, he was probably – he's probably the most – unique coach I've ever played for but one of the greatest role models I could say honestly that I've ever had in my life I mean he when I tell you he's been through it all he's been through it all and the way he helped us is more of like he was more of like I'm your head coach you could come to me with stuff but I'm also going to be I'm going to be like a big boss type of thing. You could come to me, but I'm going to, I'm going to tell you how it's going to be done. Cause we're at the junior college level and I can, and that's no one wanted to hear that, but that's what it's not what we wanted, but it's totally what we needed. The discipline. It was like military school. The discipline was you miss class. You're flipping a tire. You're flipping a 200 pound tire around the whole field. I've never heard of that before. I thought that happened in every program. No, 200 foot, uh, 200 pound tire on the field. <laughs> One time he made us run 75 minutes straight because we got in trouble as a team, 75 minutes straight. No, uh, no stopping. But the thing is, he didn't just make us do these things. He backed it up himself. If he thought he, one time he was late. He was late to class because he's a teacher as well. He was late to class <laughs> for taking his daughter to school. And he said, unacceptable. He put in the chat, unacceptable from your head coach. I have tire flips. And he sent the video of him flipping a tire across, around the field. And I was like, I'm so Unreal. If he's doing it, I'm going to do it. Unreal. So you have a coach. He starts to hold you accountable for little things. Let's uh rewind a little bit. Chris's whole life, he's been like a little rebel child, always getting in trouble with coaches, just not meeting eye to eye with people. If someone says go left, he goes right. If my mom and dad say do something, he'll do the opposite. That's just his personality. So back to me, back in Miami, if we missed a class or if we were late, the whole team would have something called punishment running or you'd be suspended for practice for a day. Chris's case is a little different. Whole team physical punishment, physical tire flips, mentally exhausting thing. But the coach actually backed it up. So the coach would do the same exact thing. He held everyone accountable to a standard, including himself, which is really cool. You don't see that a lot. I never definitely did not see that. I know a lot of other people definitely did not see that. So that's really a cool thing. This uh, seems like junior college taught you some discipline your first year. How was uh, season-wise, yeah. numbers-wise? Yeah, so when it came to the season, obviously in high school, in high school I wasn't a, a top performer on my team, um, not even close. I was like the eight-hole hitter in high school, all through high school. Um, I get to junior college, but the freshman in, in the fall, I think I had – I mean, in high school I had one home run in my career. I had one home run. Granted, I didn't have my senior year, but I only had one home run. I batted 280 high school career with one homer um, in the fall of Lewisburg. I'm hitting decent. I, I hit, I think one homer in the fall, which was good for me. I mean, I hit one homer in my whole high school career. So I was thinking I hit a homer in a college fall. I'm, I'm pretty jacked up. I'm pretty fired up about that. So yeah. when it comes to uh, the off season, I go home. Um, I do my normal training. Um, I actually, I actually do my normal training um, but I'm, I'm not 
We gyms are closed. The gyms are closed. COVID's still a thing. And we get after it in in the in the garage. We have a, we had a, we made a weight room in the garage with a platform, whole bunch of we made concrete plates, all that kind of stuff. Right, Joe? I mean, we were we we're working out. Yeah, in the, yeah, we in did. The weight we did. We did. So my off season, I would hit. I would go outside in the cold. Well, if it was not as cold, and I would I would hit off the tee a little bit, and then I'd go to the field. Joe would throw with me and we do that kind of stuff. But I lifted, I did everything at home that whole off season. I wasn't even thinking about anything else. Like I didn't go to the cages one time with COVID. It was just, you know, we're going into my freshman year of college. I'm, I mean, I was prepared, but it felt as if I wasn't doing much. And I went into my freshman year of college. I went back. And uh, with Your that kind of off season, I think it was, you had a different discipline mindset, mindset that you never different. had before. So how That's do you right. think that I, translates to this back season? In. Yeah, I think I really appreciated um, just being around my family more than I ever have when I came back from Lewisburg. Because Lewisburg, that fall was the hardest, the hardest three, four months of my life. I mean, it was just like it was crazy. I I didn't expect it to be like that. And I think it really changed my personality, kind of humbled me a little bit, uh, gave me a little more gratitude, knowing these, you know, hearing different stories of people's lives on my team and, and all that kind of stuff. And I think it, it really like, humbled me. But when I went back to, um, when I went back to Lewisburg with my mindset, um, you yeah, know, the season was one thing, but it was more of like, you know, I'm just trying to have fun playing. Um, I haven't had fun playing. I put so much stress on myself when I was in high school and I figured, you know, why not? Why not? It's time to go. It's time to get after it. And this, this spring, like, let's do it. We're two weeks away from the season. COVID-19 hits me for the first time. I, try I do COVID-19. remember you coming back home for COVID. I come home for two weeks. I came home for two weeks, the, f- the two weeks before my freshman year of college, two weeks, I was home and I missed the, f- the preseason before. And I came back for the first game. Actually, I missed the first game. I came back and I played the second game with not okay. doing anything for two weeks, which was very unique. So you play the second game and you play out through the rest of the season. And how, yeah, how, so how the season the ends season, up going. That season, it was everything I've hoped for because I've always knew I was able to perform at a high level, and for the first time, I finally did. Uh, I remember in the second game, I was I had a decent game. I was one for three. I remember texting you. I was one for three in my first game, and we were like, "That's good, whatever." Second game come the second game I play comes around and. Um, it was my second at bat, and I hit. I drive a ball to the left center gap. I hit the ball. I see it go. I put my head down. I'm rounding first. I'm 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 towing into second. I'm almost about to slide into second. I see the umpire go homer. I was like, what? I just hit a homer. I just hit a, just hit a home running column. Cool. I was like that just doesn't happen. I was like that doesn't happen. Like I was about to, I was about to head first dive into second base. Let's put it that way. I, I thought it was just a double in the gap, couple, one hopper, but the ball gets out. And I was like, hmm, okay. The next game comes around. First at bat, I go bridge dead center. I was like, that's two homers? That's the most homers I've ever had in a season. It was two. Okay. I just did it. And then I proceeded so to go. So we kept this momentum going. I mean, I proceeded to go after that seven games straight with a home run. Um, it's crazy. To this day, the hottest home run streak I've had. Um, and I, I don't know. I guess it was just building up of just be playing relaxed and all the work I've put in in high school, and it finally, finally like came out. So your freshman season comes to an end. 
after all that, different mindset, discipline, tumbled. What did, what was your numbers to finish off the freshman season? Um, so my numbers were very, very good. They were. Do you remember what they were? I think they were like. I think your average is around 400. You hit like 13 home runs or 12 home runs, if I'm not mistaken. And I'm not sure about your slugging or your RBIs, but it was a very, very good year for you. Yeah. I remember that yeah, year. I mean, it just changed you as a baseball player. It really did. Let me look at it. Let's see. I got it. Oh, yeah, I got it right here. Uh, 425 average, um, 12 homers, 60 RBIs, and. I slugged 930, and uh, there I was, first team all-conference, and I came in second in player of the year voting behind my teammate, Trenton Craig. So, pretty good freshman year. So, it, was a, these, it was a good with year. These numbers, with these numbers, you're thinking, oh, you're definitely either they're getting drafted or transferring to another big time school because as a Juca player, you could do that after one year, you could get drafted or you could transfer and mm -hmm. nothing really came in. You didn't really get too many calls. Well, is that right? Am I wrong? No, I think, I mean, I, I got, I got a decent amount of calls. I would say nothing crazy. It wasn't like, I mean, I had interest from a couple schools. I had no offers. I had a couple calls though. I had, you know, I, I had a couple schools, a couple Division One schools, but nothing insane. Um, but yeah. with the, after the draft happened, um, the draft came around. I, I didn't care too much about the MLB draft. I had nothing even on my radar on the MLB draft until it was two weeks before the MLB draft, and I get an email about this thing called the draft prospect link. I was like, what? I was like, what's the draft prospect link? Like, it's got to be a scam or something. They told me, make an account. I made an account. Okay. <laughs> Lo and behold, the account I make, I just see five teams popping up. Five professional organizations that pop up, sending questionnaires. I was confused. I was like, what is this? And um, not until I asked... Joe to ask some of his friends. Uh, I didn't know if yeah, you knew the draft prospect before. link. I didn't know what it was, but my yeah. roommates in college, have, a few of these guys had this. Yeah, so when they explained to me, like, fill out the questionnaires and stuff like that, I was, like, confused. So I fill out the questionnaires, and and then I have – it was crazy. After this whole year, I had a whole bunch of or agent organizations start reaching out, and, and different types of – of, of um of pro th of like pro invites and in my head I'm thinking a year ago I didn't have a school I was a 280 high school player with one homer like I, I didn't have any thought of like the MLB draft or anything like that it was obviously a goal I I mean I wanted to go D1 first but now I'm getting emails about draft prospect links and pro workouts and doing all this stuff and I was I was very immature about it. I was not, I was confused. I was confused. I didn't know what was going on, really. I mean, I was 19. <laughs> I had no idea. So you get all these interests, but at the end of the day, you end up going back to Juco for a second season. You go back to Juco for a second season. Everyone thought maybe this is a fluke. Maybe he's doing, it was just a one year thing. But the second season at JUCO, you put up almost the same exact numbers, right? You replicated those stats, if I'm yeah, not mistaken. Yeah, I replicated mistaken. the stats. Um, I had increased with the power. I had uh, three more doubles and two more homers. So I number so 14 homers. homers and, um, you had 14. In 14, yeah. Um, and, you know, JUCO seasons are quick. I had a career of like 250 junior college at bats which is one division one season and um 26 you know, I'm look at the career pretty good year yep mm -hmm. and um yeah so i went back my sophomore year and i i gotta be honest i went back into my sophomore year a little more swagger you know i i didn't mention before but my freshman year at juco i wore extra large pants 
I, I, I wore the classic baseball belt and an extra large number 51 jersey. <laughs> okay, I had no, as they like to say, drip. I had no drip whatsoever. I mean, not even an arm sleeve. I would just go up there, just arms out, everything, just normal, stock player. And then I go back to my sophomore year, and um, I add in a little more drip. I, uh, I get, I uh, actually, I mean, I just finished my summer summer league in uh, the Valley League in the Woodstock River Bandits. Um, and I learned, you know, I met some guys there that played D1, and I saw they had drip. So I decided to go back to my sophomore year and start wearing an arm sleeve. And, you know, just to get a little more flavor in myself, you know, to feel like I'm actually like a baseball player and really feel good. and um, so I guess that was my difference between freshman and sophomore year, you know. I think and, you're uh, to back up those stats. Yeah, I I just wanted to go back and I wanted to um to prove to people and not and obviously prove to myself that I was I it wasn't a fluke like I can do I I'm that type of player, and um yeah so I went back and I had a really good year. <laughs> So after that year, you're thinking, okay, definitely uh, going to a big D1 school or maybe even being drafted because back-to-back years like that, runner-ups uh, for JUCO Players of the Year and the voting for all of these type of awards, uh, you think big-time school, Power 5 Conference, or MLB Draft, uh, what ended up happening? Yeah. yeah, so in the fall of my sophomore year, I get um... – scholarship offer to play at Virginia Tech, which is a big ACC school, you know, so I was committed to Virginia Tech going to my, going to my sophomore year. Um, you know, Virginia Tech, obviously that year, they ended up becoming number two team in the country, um, had a fantastic year, hosted a super regional. And I was like, this is great. I was going to the number two team in the country. Or is going to go in the MLB draft. That I mean, that's that's what I was thinking. I mean, that's what it was after my sophomore year of junior college. I had a couple workouts with with major league teams that I um, I got flown to, and I had one major league team come to me actually at my high school field. Joe was throwing me BP. My other brother Nick was catching the BP, and I got you know. A major league organization standing right next to my dad and my lifetime coach. I couldn't ask for more. It was probably the greatest moment of my life. Right there and then, it was probably the greatest moment of my life. Everything I've ever wished for in high school was right there. It was a unbelievable experience being in that situation, either going to the number two team in the country or being drafted by a major league organization. And what in the two years from high school to then, I, I, if you asked me that, I would have never said that this was happening. I thought I was in a dream at that point. Yeah, I remember uh, being at that field throwing BP, and I don't know if we should mention the team or the guy's name, but I remember him after BP liking you, and he just pulls out his hand, pulls out of his pocket, and he shows us a World Series ring that he had, and I thought it was the coolest thing. We all got to take pictures with it and everything. So that was a pretty cool experience. But come draft day, uh, what was it, mid-July or mid-June, draft day comes, you have a decision to make. What's that decision? Yep. Yeah, so draft day comes. Um, you know, I remember being in, I think it was two weeks before the draft, I was in the major league, in this major league stadium. I did a workout there and, you know, once again, that was one of the best experiences of my life was taking BP, running in the outfield and, and throwing and, and being in a, in the locker room and meeting all these people and, and getting, getting all these things from a major league organization. I mean, just to work out in one of those major league organizations is, was a dream come true. And when the draft day comes, I had a decision to make. I was, um, you know, fortunate enough to have conversations to be selected in the MLB draft. Um, it was either I take the MLB draft, which 
it's always been a dream of mine, or I go play in the ACC, which was my first dream, my first everything. I mean, all I wanted to do was play in the ACC, just like my older brother, and play against his former team at that point and all the ACC teams and enjoy my college experience and, and play there. And it was a very tough decision. Um, I ended up going to Virginia Tech. I had, I declined the MLB draft um, and I ended up going to college and going to Virginia Tech. So after declining the MLB draft, Chris made his decision to go to Virginia Tech, thinking worst case scenario, he's just going to get drafted the following year. He could relive two dreams. And uh, now he's a Division One baseball player, like he always wanted to be in a Power 5 conference with the Hokies. So that's pretty good. Uh, let's do a little recap with uh, Chris's recruiting process. He started from high school, not knowing whether he was going to play baseball, basketball, or football. Ended up following me and went in the baseball route. Uh, committed to the University of Miami. COVID-19 came. No more roster spots available, so ended up going to junior college, Lewisburg. Uh, sophomore year, stayed at Lewisburg College. Uh, junior year comes around, uh, not junior year, after his sophomore year, replicated two back-to-back -back great seasons, uh, had a choice between the MLB draft or Division One baseball at the highest level with the Virginia Tech Hokies, and ended up choosing Virginia Tech. And that basically sums up Chris's uh, recruiting process. Uh, this was our first episode of uh, Talking College Baseball. And we went through the whole entire road so far for Chris. There's more to come in the future. Next episode, we're going to talk about the recruiting process I went to, went through for the University of Miami. Yeah, uh, yeah. Next episode, I you know, it's going to be Joe's story. Is I don't think there are many people in the country that have the same story as as Joe when it comes to baseball. And just life in general. I mean, his story is remarkable. I, I mean, I've had all of his friends. I've had all of his coaches telling me how remarkable a story. And personally, I can't wait to hear it myself. I, I know it. I know. I don't know too many of the details, but I'm excited. Uh, I'm sure that Joe is going to explain all the details um, on the next show. And, um, you know, I just wanted to say thank you for listening to my recruitment story. Um, you know, there's still more to come, but I appreciate you guys listening and, and really understanding how my recruitment process went. And I, I hope you enjoyed this, um, this episode. Uh, so everyone, thank you for listening. Stay safe out there. And if you have any questions, always feel free to give us a text or a call. We'll have our descriptions in the bio you can follow us on instagram and twitter at talking college baseball <laughs>